Now I'd like to welcome the artists Alex Nathanson and Pauline Van Dongen. Alex Nathanson is a multimedia artist, engineer, and educator. His work is primarily focused on exploring both the experimental and practical applications of sustainable energy technologies, particularly photovoltaic solar power. And Pauline Van Dongen, a Dutch fashion designer and researcher specializing in smart texti textiles and wearable technologies. Her design studio founded in 2010 develops alternatives to current fashion practices by exploring the role of technology in textiles and clothing. We are so happy to have you both here today and looking forward to the conversation that you will have with all of us and welcome. With that, I'll turn it over to you both. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks for, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, yeah. Uh, so as, um, as Jay said, uh, my name is Alex Nathanson and um, I am an artist, designer, <clears throat> engineer, um, and I ended up working with sustainable energy because I was curating an exhibition in an outdoor garden in Queens in 2014. And it was a show of electronic art and it turned out we didn't actually have power and we thought we did and solar power turned out to be the solution to that problem. And then it sort of has consumed my life since then. Um, and I do a lot of work. Uh, Sort of at the intersection of <clears throat> art and education um, and uh, sort of working it into my performance practice and other things as well. Um, yeah. Pauline, do you want to go ahead and yeah. introduce yourself? Take it away. Sure. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Pauline, Pauline van Dongen. Uh, I'm super happy to be here and uh, it's great to see you all joining this conversation. Um, I'm tuning in from uh, Arnhem in the Netherlands, so it's uh, 5 p.m. It's been 5 p.m. here. Um, I'm glad to see you at, at uh, an early morning on a Saturday. So um, as Jay already mentioned, I'm a, a fashion designer and a researcher, and I specialize in the combination of fashion and technology. Um, I will quickly share my screen with you so that you can um, see some images of my work, actually. I hope you're all able to, um, to see this now. Um, so I'm very interested in how technology can help us develop new relationships between humans and uh, their clothing and by means of clothing also between humans and, um, and the world. Um, as a fashion designer um, entering the fashion industry uh, in 2010, I soon got very frustrated with the with the current system um, the fact that it's one of the most polluting industries and that there's no space for for true R&D and innovation um, so that's what I decided to focus on and working with uh, solar cells with photovoltaic materials has become a big part of my work um, so here you see some of examples of that work where I've looked at the integration of solar cells into uh, into textiles and how to actually embody them and make them wearable um, and for me, that um, experience of wearing solar cells on your, on your body, uh, through your clothing, uh, is, a, is a vital one. Uh, it's not only about the idea of harvesting energy, but also how the solar cells and the interaction with uh, outdoors, with the sun, really changes your perspective on, uh, on our surroundings, on nature. Um, so yeah, when you, when you look up close uh, at these garments, it's not only about the technology itself. For me, the technology uh, is, a, is a material, uh, a material with its own aesthetic, with its own uh, features, its own tactility. Um, and one of the recent uh, projects I'm, uh, I'm doing is actually weaving these solar cells into a new textile for people to have uh, more engagement with the technology uh, as opposed to the well, rigid panels that we typically find on our rooftops or in the in the fields. So that's it. Um, it for now. Cool. Um, yeah. So just to maybe give give everyone a sense of where the, the um, prompts that I'm going to be posing to Pauline are, are sort of coming from. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been writing a book on the history of solar power art and design, um, and Part of that process, uh, Pauline, I, inter <clears throat> <excuse me. clears throat> I interviewed Pauline um, 
And it was a really great conversation. So when this opportunity came up, um, I thought, you know, it would be perfect to continue that conversation here. Um, and the questions that we'll be sort of thinking about, they're definitely not things that I think we'll have answers to. They're definitely not things that um, I have a definitive position on. Um, and I, I think Pauline feels similarly about that. Um, but their questions coming from like a place of not really seeing um, enough discussion about them in amongst like artists and designers. Um, so there's sort of questions that like I wish I heard other people talking about more um, in various ways. So, yeah. um, is there anything else you want to add, Pauline, before we uh, get into it? No, I, I totally agree. I think you framed it uh, really well. So let's get started. Um, yeah, so a lot of times the role of art in the climate discussion is focused on it as a tool for communication and community building, um, which are very important, of course, but they're not necessarily thought of as, um, or art isn't really thought of as being able to have a direct impact on the problem of the climate crisis. Um, design in general, I think, tends to be more valued, but in many discussions, it's still really relegated to this, um, to this role. And so to start with, I want us to think about like, in what ways is this maybe an accurate or inaccurate understanding of the possibilities and limitations of these fields? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think there is an underlying core um, to this question. And I think it goes back to what, what is art? What is design? And what does both art and design do to people and to the planet. Um, and of course, that's hard to say because there's many different forms of art, but if I would uh, name one um, very strong characteristic of, of art, uh, for example, is that it provides a transformative uh, experience. Um, and by being immersed in a work of art, um, you can get a perspective on a new reality and it makes you look at the world in a different way. Um, art also is able to raise questions, um, so it really challenges your, your view, I would say. And in that sense, I do think that art really impacts the climate crisis and, and is able to, uh, well, offer suggestions for solutions and is able to engage uh, people, not just from a pure communication point of view and I guess I mean it's like you said there's not a yes or no kind of answer to to these questions I mean art is often indeed used as as communication it's so it's a way to confront uh, people with something and I think it's it's also valid it's also important because with the kind of lives that we live and all the distractions that we have uh, we sometimes need that kind of very powerful um, message basically um, makes me think of this um, uh, artwork, this uh, sky, skyscraper it's called, it was a huge uh, whale made from uh, plastic that was fished out of the ocean. And it was actually, uh, when I was living in Utrecht, it was in one of the canals. So it was kind of like jumping out of the canal. And I mean, it's really a confrontation, that kind of work of art. It doesn't really immediately ask you to act upon it, um, but it's it's also important, I think. But then other other works of art, such as uh, for example, the work of Olafur Eliasson that has um, big chunks of ice from a glacier put in public spaces. I mean, this really does bring it to the core of, of people, I think, and it can help change behavior, I, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think all of that is true, but one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about is, um, you know, how, at what point can an artistic or design intervention in a technology change its trajectory? So in addition to this idea of like art as a way to create conversation or to increase awareness and things like that, um, for example, like in the design of the solar cell, um, is there, you know, if, if designers are involved in the R&D stage in lab, does it come out of the lab looking different? And then does it resonate more with, with um, a given community? Pattern is obviously like a huge, hugely important in sort of all cultures. And so 
if we like can sort of bring some of those ideas into that process, um, into that like technological development process, does it then have more of a potential to, you know, be on everyone's roof maybe because um, it feels like something familiar. It feels like something that is connected to, you know, various cultures in a more dynamic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're touching upon a really important point. I think, um, well, especially in the context of, of, of solar technology, I think um, the, the development of these technologies is, is, is driven by, well, engineers primarily. Um, and I think maybe we will come back to that later, but I think uh, um, science and, and, and engineers, they work with very exact um, numbers and figures and it's very theoretical also um and i think artists and designers um they work with with human values um and i think that kind of pers perspective should definitely be brought into um the these technological developments much earlier for them to be appreciated and be understood and be engaging for uh, a larger crowd um but maybe also coming back to that question to whether design um, impacts um, the climate crisis. I mean, I, I guess there's also a difference, like there's design that is made, design as kind of like solutions to improve uh, our planetary uh, condition. That's one thing, but there's also the other uh, approach where design in, in, its, in its kind of like intrinsic motivation that already has to stem from, from an ecological uh, awareness. Um, for example, just to give you uh, um, uh, an example of that, there is a, a project going on here in Arnhem, which is called the Linen Project, where uh, design students from a, um, a fashion school are growing their own flax. And they need to maintain the fields and like take care of it, harvest the flax, and make their own linen yarns from it. Um, so I think that's a completely different a different approach to to design and to developing new relationship with things that we wear in this case, because these are fashion designers making making uh, fashion products of it, as opposed to uh, designers that decide to use an ecological dye for their textiles just to be sustainable. You know. Um, and I think the result of these works also impact the user, the wearer differently. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think the other part of this, you know, sort of just about in what ways is this sort of an accurate understanding of art and design to think of it as having these, not, I wouldn't say smaller roles, but more different roles, um, you know, I think gets to sort of a relationship with like the the um, institutions of art and design as well. So like school systems that build into their practice or, um, you know, museums that <clears throat> don't have uh, sustainable practices as well, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, some ways like the the disciplines are limited by, um, you know, the, the folks with the most money and the most impact at the top who um, on the whole aren't really invested in these issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you, you work a lot also in, in education, right? I mean, so you're also very familiar with how to, um, how to uh, democratize um, uh, some, of the, some of the materials and, and, and skills and, and tools that are necessary to, to make such uh, uh, works of art or pieces of design. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. And I, I do think, you know, these roles of like, I definitely don't want to um, minimize the importance of art as a tool for <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. education and community, because those are hugely important, particularly mm -hmm. around, um, you know, giving people agency in, you know, being able to have an input in like the decisions that impact their lives. So mm -hmm. if you're, you know, in a, um, you know, frontline community and you know, directly experiencing the impacts of climate change. Um, certain you know, types of art and design can definitely be like an avenue for um, building equity and agency. And things like that. Yeah, I think also what, what will make or the kind of art that makes a big difference there are um, 
works of art and design that um, use participatory and co-creation processes. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, it's an interesting sort of question, I think, in terms of like what, how we think of it, what we think of as the um, efficacy of these things and their impact. Um, so there's a lot of different like levels of success that a work can have if it's particularly if it's like engaging with a community. Um, and definitely, yeah, participatory and interactive work has, in my experience, has much more of an impact. Um, and also in like studies I've read around looking at the ability of an artwork to change a climate denier into a uh, climate aware person, um, you know, participation is sort of one of the term determining factors, yeah. it seems yeah. like. Um, yeah. Also a lot of ambiguity around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that I'm very interested in myself also because, well, like I've shown, I've, and like you know, I've developed quite a few um, uh, garments and like a backpack and all integrating solar technology. Um, but these were designed, um, well, by myself and the people that I work with, that I collaborate with. Um, and of course, in, in, in conversation with the people around me, but not by the people around me necessarily. So right now, um, I'm also very, um, well, critically looking at my work and also looking at what could be a next step and how to really closely involve other people in making these solar textiles. And that's also why this, this project of weaving with solar cells for me came about because I, I wanted the material to be something that people could hold into their hands, that they could actually make themselves. Um, because, well, solar cells are not a material that people typically get to work with. Um, and I think during this making process, we're, we're planning a series of uh, workshops uh, once we're allowed to get together again, um, is that during this making process, it, it allows for sharing stories. And I'm particularly curious to hear from people like how they relate to the sun or what are their daily routines or habits that relate to the sun, to sunlight, to energy or to sustainable energy. And yeah, by going through that weaving process and, and sharing these kind of thoughts and ideas, also understanding better how this material, this, this solar textile, I have a piece of it here, how this material could be integrated in people's everyday lives and how it could lead to a different engagement uh, with uh, sustainable energy. Um, yeah, so that is a very well practical example of how I personally am now approaching it. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I sort of immediately thought of you to be a part of this conversation is that I think textiles occupy this really um, interesting space within clean sustainable energy art and design because the techniques that are sort of used in it are like you know, they date back to, you know, thousands of years. Um, and so it's a very, it's simultaneously like the, I think the hardest space to work in, but has all of this like built in sort of cultural value, um, particularly like with the flexibility of material. So within the solar industry, um, you know, the more rigid a solar module is, the more, the easier it is to manufacture, the easier it is to install and deploy and all these things. Um, but once you start putting it on like a piece of textile, it becomes incredibly fragile. So it's this like incredible engineering challenge, um, but also has all of these like connections to skills and techniques and technologies that are based in, um, you know, culture and, and community. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just like a huge, yeah, there's just a huge amount of potential in my mind for, for um, that, that area. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Yeah. For me, that, that is a very important driver. I mean, the, the fact that clothing, textile, it's so ubiqu ubiquitous. Um, everyone can relate to it. And it also has this very, well, personal and, and intimate quality to it. And that's why I think it can have, uh, such a such an impact if you if you for example wear uh, solar cells I mean I've been wearing my own solar t-shirt for a long time now and um, 
you start realizing these subtle subtle changes in your in your perception and in your behavior um, and I've written about that also in my in my PhD uh, thesis where I uh, look at those experienced through the lens of uh, philosophy of technology in particular um, post phenomenology um, so basically when I would wear the t-shirt and I would go out on the street um, I uh, unconsciously actually started walking on the on the sunny side of the street and also you become more aware of the of the weather conditions uh, basically the t-shirt invites you to go out outside more often so there's also always all these subtle nuances um, that really impact how you go about your day really when you wear this t-shirt um, and and also really shows that you have to feel comfortable in it. So indeed, like you said, with these kind of like rigid solar panels, they don't really invite any intimate engagement really. Whereas with this kind of t-shirt, it needs to make you feel good and you need, need to feel confident in it. And it needs to provide you with this energy on one hand, but at the same time, if you go out at night when there's no sunlight and the t-shirt is not functional, so to say, um, or at least not harvesting energy, it still should make you feel good. And um, I think um, for designers, that, that is, it's really important to work with, with those aspects and to not really stare blindly at the functionality of the technology, really. Yeah. So I was wondering, I mean, there's a lot of sort of, obviously there's a lot of differences and tensions between science and engineering and art and design activism. Um, and we sort of touched on this a little bit, but particularly, I think, in the context of um, both like global pandemic and climate change, um, the, the impacts disproportionately uh, affect um, poor people, people of color, other like marginalized communities. And a lot of times I think we don't necessarily, within the communities that um, we're working in, we, we don't think enough about um, the way these sort of tensions between disciplines can be used to the benefit of these communities specifically. Um, we definitely like talk a lot about how climate change is inherently a social justice, social justice issue. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I, I want to spend some time thinking about like the differences between disciplines, the way we've been sort of talking about it and how that sort of intersects with that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm happy you asked this question because, well, like, like probably most of you, I mean, I'm getting really frustrated with all these people saying, oh, the, this pandemic uh, affects all of us. And it's like, yeah, it does affect all of us, but not equally. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I see, see people on Instagram, like, buying toys for their kids to entertain them during this lockdown situation. And you're like, yeah, well, you, you must be glad that you can buy these toys to entertain them. But there are a lot of people who are living in a completely different situation. And um, I think we should be uh, um, uh, more conscious of that. So um, I think, uh, yeah, also an another thing that that really um made me made me uh made me think during this pandemic is that in 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 holland at least we have our national institute of health um already saying and the the politics are there the government is saying well we we should move towards a um 1.5 meter society with the social distance, distancing norms and again that's a very scientific way of approaching this new reality that we live in um and it's not something that's that can be practically executed like it's not as simple as that you cannot just say well one and a half meter let's just go about our days and and respect that there's a lot of different consequences and i think it I think it needs a lot of um design thinking design power to um to creatively deal with that and to make it workable for everyone um and to come back to this um, um, uh, point of um, people being af affected dis disproportionately, um, I think we have a tendency, especially with the climate crisis, but also with this pandemic, to look at things at a global scale. Um, 
but there are many different skills, of course. And if we look at the global scale, we will never see the nuances. We will never see people's individual uh, struggles. Um, and I think this is an opportunity to, besides the global outreach and skill that we, that we have nowadays, that we also um, tackle these issues from a very local and maybe at a, at a neighborhood level, so to say. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure, I don't know how the tension within, with, between science and design and art comes in there. It's actually a really good one. Um, I wonder also how you feel about that, but. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that the pandemic makes very clear is just something that's maybe for a lot of people harder to see in the context of climate, which is um, the sort of privilege of being able to make sustainable or healthy personal choices. Because obviously like not everyone can um, work from home or, um, you know, uh, be physically capable of biking to work and people have to take the subway or, um, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so that sort of aspect of climate, um, climate justice, I think is much harder for people to visualize. Um, so, so I think that's sort of, you know, there's, there's a lot of lessons to learn from this ongoing crisis. Um, but and a lot of I've heard a lot of people talk about it as like a dress rehearsal for the climate emergency. Um, but I, I think thinking about like what this crisis makes visible um, is really important. And as far as sort of the tensions between disciplines, I mean, the way I was sort of thinking about that was like, what is um, what what are sort of the the things that um, the benefits and the challenges that come out when designers collaborate with scientists or this collaborate with scientists. Um, and are those sort of moments of tension um, that sometimes work out really well and sometimes like reveal things that aren't working so well? Um, are there things we can like learn from that? Um, so I know like in the US, a lot of funding is, um, you know, for these types of collaborations is comes from the science side of things. It comes from the National Science Foundation, um, other entities. It's much harder for a designer or an artist in collaboration with research scientists to get the funding. Um, and so because of that, like there does tend to be this tension between what the work focuses on and what comes out of that and also sort of the power dynamics in that collaborative relationship. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's relevant to, to the issue of um, inequality in climate, um, but I, I think, yeah, it's, it's um, I want to throw that out there as like a space to think about, I guess. Yeah, no, you're, you're, uh, you're making a very good point. And it makes me think also about the context that I'm in myself working often with um, research center and uh, a lot of well, engineering driven uh, companies. And one of the tensions that really s always strikes me, um, or yeah, even continues to strikes me, strike me um, is um, this kind of difference in approach. Like often when I'm working with these te technological companies or research centers, they, they have a very top down approach. And you can see that reflected also in the outcome of the projects it has a high degree of determinism and it's not grounded um in a um real context so to say with real people and whereas i think if i do other projects with other creatives or by myself initiated by myself then i much rather work from a bottom-up approach uh, in connection with the people that i intend to design for and with um, and I think, yeah, those are very different. And I think they need to be brought closer together in order to be effective. Um, yeah, and yeah, well, that, that, that's, I think, my, my, main, yeah. uh, my main problem there. I mean, I think the other part of that, maybe more from like the research scientist or engineering side is an idea around efficiencies. Um, so we talk about like 
people who are directly impacted by climate change, um, you know, this is an ongoing crisis. People are already being displaced, yeah. people are already dying. Um, so the need for things that are not experimental, that are not like an art project, but that like are a thing that works is really, um, really, really necessary. And so that's obviously like, I think something that is more built into the engineering and research science mm -hmm. aspect of this is like, the goal is to produce a solution that has um, a very specific outcome that actually, you know, materially impacts people's lives. Um, and so then sometimes, you know, when art or design come into that, it, um, it's seen as like a barrier to reaching those very important goals. Um, yeah. And so that, that challenge, that tension there, I think is, um, is really not to be understated. Because yeah. that is also why, like, you know, going back to the first prompt, I think that art and design does get, you know, um, uh, much more of this, like, um, communication focus, because they're communication mediums, right? But, um, but also because there are these, like, very real, serious issues that need to be kept at, you know, the forefront of everyone's mind as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I can t totally relate to that, especially because when I step into an uh, engineering context, I'm often seen as this fashion designer that deals with this frivolous, um, uh, superficial domain of fashion, which obviously it's not. Uh, so I always have to point out to, to some of the engineers, at least, that I work with, like how important it is to be dressed and what, what it does to you and that it's not just simple, simply uh, a means to cover your body or to you know, communicate or express your identity, it, it gives you so much more, like also in terms of uh, feeling grounded, being comfortable, nurturing yourself and, and so on. Um, and obviously also communicating and being in touch with people through, through your clothes. Um, so yeah, like, like you said, like when, when engineers deal with, with efficiency, then often from a design or from an engineering point of view, looking at design or fashion design, um, they often think it's only concerned with aesthetics. So once I start weaving the solar textile, it, it really stirs up interesting conversations uh, with some of the engineers that I work with also, because they, they're like, well, you're actually cutting up solar cells and reducing their efficiency, um, weaving them into a textile with a labor intensive process. Um, so what is really the point of this? Like we have these solar cells, these large films or foils that you can roll out on a, on a rooftop. Um, so why would you even make your life so complicated and make this textile? But then if you would look at it only through an aesthetic lens, you're missing the point. Because for me, it's all about having, giving people the opportunity to have these solar cells in their hands and making something and understanding what it means to make a textile, what it means to have a piece of textile really generating energy um, for, you, for you and handling this material really. Um, that, that's for me what it's all about and, and the opportunity also for people to, to put something of their self in, their, in this textile by working with color, by working with pattern and just like you mentioned, like the history of, of, of textile of course has so, so many uh, iconography in it and so many you know patterns and things that that really tie into uh, our cultural foundations yeah and i think you know the other another sort of piece of that is as like many people i'm sure in the you know watching this know like a lot of times art you know that's involving technology ends up being relevant 20 years down the road because it's exploring a sort of the material property of something that's not ready for a full scale sort of um, manufacturing rollout. And the weaving stuff in particular is really fascinating to me because um, there's researchers, there's a, a woman named Trisha Andrews, who a um, uh, chemist and like material scientist who studies, um, you know, the way like light waves interact with the wave patterns of weaving as like a method for um, thinking about like efficiencies of absorbing light in solar cells that 
wouldn't be manufacturable for you know decades. Um, and so I think there are also some uh, some real um, efficiency values of design that we might not see yet as well. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. well. And so, I mean, I think this idea of efficiency ties in very well to like my next question, um, which is about user experience in sort of art and design that incorporates sustainable energy technologies. Um, you and I are particularly familiar with solar power in various forms, but um, I think it's relevant to other forms of sustainable energy as well. Um, so what are the challenges to prioritizing user experience in your work? And what are the sort of risks that you run if you don't take that into account? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nice to talk about that, uh, especially from um, a fashion point of view, because I think, or one of my um, uh, arguments or, uh, yeah, what I see as one of the flaws of the current fashion system is that there, there is no attention for, for user experience, really. Um, most fashion products like, well, let's say a t-shirt, for example, is made based on a kind of like uh, a model of uh, a specific size range, uh, of course, with a, with a certain end user wearer in mind. Um, and it's probably um, sampled and, and worn, like fitted just to qualify the, the, the fitting and the, and the um, fit of the garment. But once it, it's bought, in a by a person in a store and it the garment leaves the store with that person that's it that's where the dialogue with the with the customer ends and then the the, the company the retailers is basically focused on the next sales um and I, I think that that's where it really goes wrong that there's no dialogue with the end user and for me especially working with a lot of technologies, not only solar technology, but also all kinds of sensors and, and actuators in clothing, it's become so important to, uh, to listen to the experience of, of users and to be aware of how people interpret um, these, uh, these technologies, how they, um, whether they like it, whether they are frightened by it, why, whether it's comfortable or not. Um, and I think this, this should be, implemented in the fashion system as a whole. Um, I think we, we would definitely um, better the, the, the system with that. But of course it, it does come with a lot of challenges. That's why it's, it's currently not being uh, implemented, I would say. Um, and I think one of the th reasons is because user experience in general is, is very ambiguous. Uh, it's not something that you can do quickly. It's, it requires a lot of um, time and attention. Um, of course, user experience is, is very subjective to interpretation. So it also really depends who's looking at this kind of like qualitative data. Uh, you, as a, as, a, as a person analyzing the data, you have to be an informed, informed, I would say informed participant also to be able to better understand people's, um, people's comments, people's feedback. Um, because they should be considered the expert once you are um, starting a, a, a user experience uh, study. Um, and even, yeah, I mean, coming from a fashion background, it, it honestly, it took me quite a lot of work and trials and errors in order to get to that point where I felt, felt comfortable with, with doing these kind of user experience studies and feeling confident also about the, the results that I was getting with it. And, and additionally, feeling comfortable with um how i was able to then use those insights into my design practice um because the fact that it's that it's ambiguous um also uh, requires you to kind of work with your design in a, in a more open-ended way so that once people start wearing your garment it is not necessarily designed for this but it's designed for a whole spectrum of experiences and depending on who's wearing your garment your design every one of that person will give their own meaning to it i think um so yeah that that's how it was for me at least um uh, working with this yeah i mean i think 
the uh, another you know something that um i think about a lot in terms of uh why this um sort of ux approach needs to be prioritized is with you know something like um, a jacket that might have solar cells on the back um it might work technically fine mm -hmm. might you know do what it was designed to do but if the wearer let's say the wearer walks to work west to east in the morning and the cell the jacket doesn't actually get direct sunlight um from that person's perspective the jacket isn't working if it's technically working as far as they're concerned you know it's broken um and so that sort of leads to this idea of like or connects to that idea of efficiency which is like i mean maybe it was designed you know engineered perfectly and so on paper it's as efficient as it could be but then when it comes in contact with the real world um that efficiency is you know functionally zero because um the user actually doesn't have um you know the ability to like have it work within their their lifestyle yeah 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 that's that's totally true and i think um um understanding how people deal with with whether it's a garment or any other kind of product in our everyday lives this 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 very subjective and, and uh, personal understanding of what, what people do with these garments, what these garments go through physically, um, I think is really, really important, not just from the perspective of integrating technology in, into uh, garments and working with solar cells, for example, but also from a larger perspective of sustainability. Because if we understand how people treat their garments, and how we can redesign garments for people to take care of their garments better or to develop new kind of relationships with it because the garment invites a different kind of engagement, a different kind of interaction with it. Um, then the things we, we design can have um, a longer lifespan potentially. Um, and of course, there's a lot of, um, other things needed for that. I mean, not just awareness of the um, the way people treating these products, but also the types of materials that we choose and the types of um, yeah conversations that we can have with people about the products that we that we develop. Yeah. Um, so, in the context of like you know personal. Uh, devices and things like that, um, and a lot of art projects. I think it's particularly important um, to think about the sort of debate between personal behavioral change versus uh, systemic change. So, you know, I think one of the most prominent narratives over the entire history of the environmental movement, um, particularly in first world countries, is that um, behavioral change, personal choices are really important. Um, and, and they are to an extent, particularly in countries that consume disproportionately and um, mm -hmm. you know, impact the climate crisis more, but they really just need to be a starting point. And I, I think that increasingly a lot of people are realizing that the, the thinking around personal choices is in many ways a distraction from um, sort of, you know, it's a way to shift blame away from the largest industries that are destroying the planet, um, you know, the oil and gas majors and things like that. Um, so, but at the same time, like a lot of art and design at the scale that um, you and I work in for the most part is very much focused on um or, or is at the personal scale i wouldn't want i don't want to necessarily say it's focused on personal choice but i would say it's at the personal scale um, and so i wonder how art and design that is at that scale can sort of respond to those criticisms and also how the value of personal sort of um or maybe small scales the better word um small scale sustainable energy systems changes in the context of resiliency instead of sustainability, which is, of course, also different than directly impacting the environment. 
Mm-hmm. It's a big question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess. I mean, to begin with, we we all have a shared responsibility, right? Like both both large polluting industries with all of their political lobbies, but also individuals. Um, yeah, and, and this whole idea of behavioral change, it's, it's very complex and I don't think art can be solely responsible for it. Um, I don't know, if I, if I look at, yeah, you're right, like my work and, and your work too, it, it very much affects um, the personal skill indeed. And I think one thing that we really lost as a society is this, um, this, this sense of, of belonging to the world and being in touch with, with our environment. And I think solar technology can really clearly show that because, it, because of its connection with the sun and the enormous role the sun has in our lives, even though that role has been compromised by, um, well, other technologies such as artificial lighting and, uh, and the screens that we end up sitting way too long behind every day and um, our circadian rhythms that are being affected. Um, but I think by wearing solar cells, for example, you can become more, more in tune with that. Um, and it enables you on a personal level to become somewhat more self-sustainable. Um, and that kind of, that, that is a kind of empowerment because then at that point, I mean, maybe it's just an incremental change if you talk about a garment, but the more you are, um, um, the more you have, yeah, the more you, you get that in your, in your kind of like life world, the more you become, uh, the less you become um, dependent on, on such industries. Um, so I, I think there, there, is a, there is a opportunity in that sense. And then, then it's not so much that you're demanding a specific behavioral change. It's more that you give people the opportunity to, to regain a certain um, uh, connection with, with, their, with the world around them, with the natural world. Um, for example, what we're planning to do, um, what we're now um, um, finding some, some partners and funding for is to um, bring the the solar textile that that I'm currently weaving to bring that material to uh, a small community uh, in uh, in Mozambique, uh, where the people live uh, um, largely off grid and with very little uh, resources. Uh, of course, with uh, this off grid gives them certain opportunities, but also limitations, and we want to strengthen them them. And as, as well as their um, uh, local craft uh, community, it's a group of women that uh, that have specific um, basket weaving techniques. And we want to uh, try and see what what the um, solar fabric can um, can bring to them and how it can support them. Um, so yeah, I think it's it can create these kind of like people that are that are becoming separate from these larger industries. That, that's one way maybe to look at it, but uh, definitely not the only way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the, you know, I think the, uh, another sort of, um, yeah, definitely, I think there's a million answers to this question. Mm -hmm. um, one piece of it is that, you know, our, our governments, particularly in the U.S., are just not acting. And yeah. in the context of, like, uh, an emergency, um, you know, you have to just sort of do what you can until, you know, there's maybe more of an impact from mm -hmm. the people who are actually capable of doing more change. Um, yeah. I think that's another sort of important yeah. piece of that. Um, but I also think thinking about the, yeah, the difference, like I, like I mentioned, between resiliency and sustainability and having an impact on the problem is really important to consider in this context as well. So like, because, you know, if you think about um, in Northern California, uh, I think it was over a million people had their power cut off because preemptively because of forest fire risk um, over the past, you know, uh, I think it was in 2019 where it hit that, hit that number of people. Um, 
And so in that context, if you think about the impact of even just a garment that can charge your cell phone, all of a sudden, like that actually has a lot of importance mm -hmm. because, <clears throat> excuse me, um, because then when you're shifting that focus to like resiliency, that personal um, capability becomes much, much more valuable to you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is also like a really important distinction that a lot of folks working at this scale need to sort of articulate or, or vocalize when they talk about the impact of their work. Because um, in my mind, they're, they're related, but distinct. Um, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And what you also just said made me think again about the, the tension between uh, science and, and art and design as well. Because uh, you mentioned uh, that with this state of emergency governments and, and people in general, we should act, right? Uh, yeah, then suddenly I thought about how when I work with uh, some of the, the scientists, uh, especially at the, the national uh, research organization that I uh, collaborate with regularly, I, I sometimes get a little bit frustrated because it's, it, they end up uh, staying too much in the theoretical realm. Whereas I'm very pragmatic and very hands-on as a designer. So I immediately want to make something and try it out and, you know, put it on my own body, have someone else wear it or, and um, yeah, they tend to like, from, from, from my point of view, they tend to overthink. And then by the time they actually start making the thing they came up with, it has all these flaws because they didn't really iteratively just make a quick mock-up and like fill and redo it and um yeah i don't know i just wanted to <laughs> yeah. mention this as well because that's another thing that uh, i think can can maybe help us like by by really tackling the problem hands-on and not just theorizing and and uh, of course we have to think about it and talk about it but we also just have to do things and even if they don't work out the way we planned, then at least we can learn from that and redo it in a different way. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I think um, we're about at the time we should sort of shift over to Q and A, but maybe um, just to end this discussion with, because this is obviously like such a huge topic. Um, and I'm sure there's things that you are really, you know, um you're concerned about that obviously we didn't get to and and same for me and and so maybe if we just want to end on like doesn't even need to be like a back and forth so much but if there's something that you want to throw into the mix that is like totally outside of what we've been talking about um maybe that would be like a good way to sort of end it in a way that like speaks to you know how many questions there are in this area um so for me like one thing i've been thinking about a lot is the relationship between um, the art labor mu movement, which is becoming really important in New York City, and the sustainability of institutions, of art institutions in New York. Um, and I, I, I find that there's a very um, strong connection between labor conditions in museums and the sustainable practices of those museums in, their, in the way they install and deinstall shows and things like that. Um, so I know that's like totally outside of what we had been talking about, but I just want to like throw that as like a, a uh, another thing I could spend an entire day talking about. Um, so I wonder if you have anything like that that's been on your mind. Um, well, I'm actually particularly curious. I mean, you have you're you're working on a book, right? And yeah. you have talked to to so many people. So I think um, you have a wealth of knowledge now of all these different projects and perspectives and all that is happening in the space of solar design and technological um, development. Um, I don't know, I was hoping maybe that you could share uh, one example of uh, either a project or a person that really um, stood out for you or that you can give an example of. Um, yeah, oh man. That's maybe the hardest question for me because it's literally all my, you know, most of my time is just spent, uh, yeah, in that um, universe trying to get
getting excited about one thing and immediately getting excited about the thing I'm writing about on the next page. Um, but yeah, um, hmm. I, I'm momentarily stumped, but uh, <laughs> we can I, get back to it later. <laughs> um, yeah, I would I would just say um, I think the thing that is so exciting to me is about the like range of conceptual approaches to working with um, solar pa pa panels or solar power as a medium and the like huge range of just the ways people think about the poetics about it. So like mm. there are things, you know, that um, working with or um, bringing the solar cell into a visible space um, enables. So maybe it's something around um, sort of uh, poetic notions of like randomness from the way clouds interact with the sun. And if you're making a little like <clears throat> um, solar powered instrument, it's going to have these like really dynamic and mm -hmm. interesting, you know, um, aesthetic patterns that emerge. Um, but there's, you know, for everyone, like, <clears throat> if you asked a hundred artists, they would have like a different idea of what solar power allows them to communicate. Um, or explore. And so that just as like the overarching theme of the art part of the book in particular, um, as opposed to like the design stuff, um, I think is really exciting in that way. Yeah, it's beautiful. Great. Um, so yeah, should we turn it over to questions? Sure. Yeah, let's do so. I just wanted to introduce myself quickly. Hi, I'm Joanna from iBeam. I'll be taking your questions in the chat box. So feel free to post anything and I'll read them out loud. Thanks. I guess I should have asked if there are questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there, there's, there's still a lot of open ends to this conversation. Yeah. So a lot of uh, potential for questions, I would say. There are yeah. some questions. Um, <laughs> I'll go ahead and read them out. Uh, this is from Kate Beck. Pauline, how did you begin working with solar energy? And given that the climate crisis is such a complex issue, how would you both suggest breaking it down into manageable issues to address with art and design? Big question there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me it's in the begin. chat box if you want to reference it again. Okay. <laughs> Let me begin with the, with the first part. Um, so I started working with um, uh, solar cells in 2013. Um, it actually came from a collaboration um, with a solar energy expert and um, uh, another person who is a, well, I would call him a business developer, but he was very, still is very uh, uh, much focused on um, solar technology and all kinds of uh, um, sustainable energies um, in in relation to um, design and art and festivals and, and so on. So he was trying to push that technology and we had a we had several conversations in the beginning and since I had already worked with some electronics in my design um, I, I kind of understood some of the basic basic principles and I was well, already really fascinated by the idea of generating energy through your body because the previous project that I did a lot, uh, needed batteries. And I thought, well, why do we need to rely on, on, um, on, on the toxic batteries, first of all? And um, they're also not, um, they need to be continuously powered. They're not comfortable to wear. They're bulky. Um, so that was one of the starting points. And I, really liked exploring these materials. So I basically started just with gathering a lot of solar cells. I just looked online for a lot of OEM solar cell parts. Um, there was this company Powerfilm, I think they still exist in the US. Um, and uh, I ordered some small flexible cells. And I also ordered some, some crystalline, the more rigid solar cells. And the solar expert that I worked with handed me over some, some materials and I just started exploring these with the help of him, of course, because I'm not an engineer. Um, and yeah, over time by exploring these materials hands-on and by trying them out and finding different solutions to comfortably and aesthetically integrate them into textiles, but to also respect, um, well, all the um, uh, 
conductive tracks and wiring that you would need to implement. Yeah, over time I, I developed a kind of like um, method to, to, to do so. Um, and some of that is also described actually in my, in my thesis. Um, it's this book that I um, published last year and it also is meant as a kind of guide for designers of how to work with technology and solar cells uh, being one of them. Um, how to treat them in your design process. Um, yeah, and I never stopped working with it since, so just kept on rolling. Um, the second question, um, I need to re-read it. I can read it out oh, again if you like. Breaking it down. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, for me as a designer, um, I try not to overwhelm myself too much with the the scale and the, and the enormous size of, of this issue um, because I think it can be numbing and kind of um, well if I um, and I guess a lot of us have that problem that if you uh, immerse yourself too much in 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 the in in this reality if you uh, uh you, d you also develop some anxiety and you develop a lot of worry which of course is is, is fair and true um but i think it, from a design point of view it's sometimes also difficult to then move through that anxiety and worry and then come up with something um creatively and have the kind of headspace that you need to to yeah to bring in a new perspective and to bring in uh something that could provide a solution um uh, so I, I i try to um always work from the material for me at least that's that's my way of i don't know i guess every designer has their own uh, approach in that but for me all of my work always starts with the material and in that sense the solar cells when i have them in my hands that's where the design process starts and um, by physically exploring and, and iterating through different designs, um, I get to a point and reflect on what can be the value or the contribution to this larger problem instead of yeah, starting with this huge problem and then trying to bring it down. I, I don't know, I hope that helps. <laughs> I think that makes yeah, a lot I mean, of sense. My, uh, my thought would be similar, like the reason I continue working with solar as I think it lends itself to the um, the scale at which I can work and still have a meaningful um, exploration of the material. It's it's much harder to um, at least like like I'm in um, I'm in Red Hook, Brooklyn. So while I am adjacent to the East River, I don't necessarily want to put like a water um, you know turbine in it. Um, like it would not be, you know, I just wouldn't be able to like do it in a way that was dynamic or, or experimental um, or, you know, and the same would be like with wind. Um, it would be hard to really like play with the material. Um, so as an engineer, it, that's sort of why I, I keep coming back to solar is that it like works at the scale that um, I'm in, like the affordances of the material work at that way um, for my particular capabilities. So I, I would say that's maybe the way to that I would recommend thinking about how to enter the space is like what 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 are you drawn to um, and what piece of that fits into your uh, workflow, I guess. Thanks. And we have another question here, which is for both. Um, this is also a big question, so I'll read it out in parts. Uh, this one's from Sarah. How do we combat decades of selling consumer capitalist ideals to countries who have brought, in, uh, have brought into our def definition of GDP as quality of life uh, and that are now just industrializing? Is it an oxymoron to have industrialization happen sustainably? Uh, and there is actually another subpart to this question you might want to answer separately. Does the global north have the right to negotiate limits after decades of pollution? So how do we combat decades of selling consumer capitalist ideals to countries who have mm -hmm. are just now industrializing? Yeah. yeah. 
um, it's a big question and it, uh, it, it really touches upon um, ethics as well, I think. Um, it makes me think of a conversation I had um, a couple months ago at a um, textile fair, actually, um, with, a, with a woman who was working in Ethiopia um, in the textile industry and, um, well, trying to promote sustainability and sustainable materials uh, there. And she also, well, we were chatting about how, how difficult it was for her also to find the right balance between on one hand helping people grow their businesses and become profitable and in some way yeah selling the capitalist model in a way but at the same time then also um advocating for sustainability and wanting wanting the people there also to be conscious about the consequences of industrialization and mass production. Um, and I, I think it's hard, it's hard for um, even myself uh, to, to say something about that uh, without being in that position and without really being engaged with the people who, uh, who are in those, um, uh, who are living in those countries and, um, who are of course in, in need of uh, uh, um, a better financial uh, situation and um, better quality of life. Um, but it also, the, the question also uh, kind of ties into what we see around us on, on Instagram where um, influencers are kind of like promoting sustainable products, but at the same time promoting consumerism together with that. Like, if we buy sustainably, sustainably, but keep on buying in the speed that we do, then there's no point in sustainability that that is not sustainable in itself. So, um, yeah, and it, it, it has to do, of course, with our, um, our concept of, of growth and especially economic growth. Uh, I think th th there is a whole layer underneath that we should um, be able to transform first before we can industrialize sustainably, I would say. Yeah, that will be kind of my, my answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say that we, we don't have the right to negotiate limits. Um, you know, who are we to say that like somebody in, you know, a place that is particularly impacted by rising, <clears throat> rising temperatures shouldn't run an air conditioner, you know? Like, I don't mm -hmm. think we should be saying that. Um, you know, a lot of the, when we, I think a lot of times when we talk about like the industrialization of, um, of uh, you know, I guess the global south in a lot of ways or, um, you know, like developing countries, um, a lot of those things are things like, you know, refrigeration for vaccines, for better healthcare and things like that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't, I think it's, it's from that perspective, the th it's about um, a lot of times in the sort of sustainable energy world, people say like electrify everything, make that electricity clean. Um, and so I think that is the sort of approach globally. So not just in places that are industrializing now, but you know, also in, um, the U.S. and everywhere is that, um, you know, that those shouldn't be coal plants, right? They should be um, solar farms, wind farms, um, other sustainable energy sources. So the challenge is, um, you know, I think how do we, um, how do we, you know, support those technologies? And so that like, you know, solar right now is, beats coal on price. So now if you're in, um, you know, and I don't have like specific data in front of me, but as far as I'm aware, I think pretty much anywhere in the world, it's cheaper to build the equivalent amount of solar. Um, you know, there's other in infrastructural challenges and things like that, but um, yeah, so I guess that's my, my sort of answer to that is like, we definitely can't, tell anyone to not consume more 
Um, but we just, we need to work to make the consumption um, cleaner or, you know, less dangerous maybe. Thanks both. I'm gonna be switching off with Joanna. Uh, in asking the questions. Um, this is coming from Jenny Ayrton. Uh, really interesting to hear about the anxiety side of things, Pauline. I can definitely relate to that. A practical question for you both, when it comes to testing and exhibiting, how do you demonstrate your pieces? Sun lamps are great for testing on gloomy days, but are obviously power hungry and not suitable for, for leaving on in an exhibition to demonstrate solar artworks. Mm -hmm. Shall I begin? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's a nice question. Um, yeah, I often, uh, I've often demonstrated my work and I did run into challenges because sometimes I would be in a, um, um, dark, um, uh, dark space, like indoors with a, I don't know, a stage and maybe some, some lights here and there, of course. Um, but it would be hard to, uh, um, to generate enough energy to really, um, um, show for example that you could you could power a phone or something else i mean i've i've had different uh solutions i mean sometimes i i really worked closely i had the opportunity sometimes to work closely with the uh, uh organizers to come up with a solution so that they would bring like either a particular light if we were indoors or would place my work in an area in an exhibition space that was um um in a in a light with in a room with with daylight um but i also did some i also made some smaller um samples to facilitate um the kind of engagement with with an audience i made these um small well a4 size letter size uh, swatches with a so with a series of solar cells on it and some, some small leds embedded where people could actually put their hands on top and cover up the solar cells to see the light go off and then put their hands off the material and then suddenly see the light um, uh, go on again. So that was, I don't know, it's, it's funny how uh, such a small thing can um, stir so much reaction with people because it always really worked really well for people to experience that themselves in an exhibition. Yeah, um, I, I would agree that, you know, the testing aspect of doing um, of prototyping solar is really difficult. Um, one of the things that has been on my to-do list for like way too long now is to make like a zine just about like prototyping and troubleshooting for that specific reason. Um, but I do think it's just a huge problem that artists working with solar run into. Um, and I've run into it in my just freelancing life when I'm engineering something or if I'm doing like, you know, project management or just a more supportive role in a solar power installation, um, the people organizing the exhibit almost never get it right. Um, like, you know, I, I've definitely, you know, showed up for, yeah, you know, it's different if like I'm the like lead on it because then I can take the sort of role in making sure that communication is clear about the needs. Um, but I, I've definitely shown up to jobs where the solar installation was positioned directly under like the biggest tree I've ever seen in my life. Um, and so like, obviously it's not gonna work. Um, but yeah, so I think that continues to be a problem. Um, I, I think in terms of like using a lamp um, in like the in indoor context, it's all about what is important to you to try to convey to the viewer. So if you're dead set on having like the platonic ideal of the work shown, it just, maybe it's there, but it's like just off. And you say like, yeah, this is solar power, we're inside. Um, but I think in most contexts, yeah, like, like as Pauline was saying, like people are excited to engage and they can make the jump between a uh, lamp and, and sun. Um, yeah. Thank you. And I have the next one as well. Uh, this is coming from PS. Uh, having a career in art or design seems to require to be in New York, Berlin, and elsewhere at once, jetting between biennials, participating in exhibitions all over the place, being present globally. It's not sustainable, obviously. How can a new generation of artists and designers be successful while breaking with the established airplane-based lifestyle that many before us built careers on? 
Yeah, super valid question. And yeah, something that I, uh, I definitely have been struggling or even still am struggling with. Um, though luckily at the moment, well, right now, obviously, anyway, not. But even the last year or so, I have not been traveling that much for work compared to what I did before. Um, I think also this, the current situation, at least I am having uh, quite, um, quite some conversations with different groups of people about also how this uh, pandemic is affecting us and how we need to establish new ways of, um, well, virtually being present in, in different uh, locations. But obviously for the long run and also not just in the context of the pandemic, but also the uh, climate emergency is um, definitely challenges us, us to come up with new um, new new practices for that. And honestly, I think it's something that we also, as a um, community of artists and designers, should should be responsible for uh, and should find solutions for together because um, I think it's, it's often easy to say for uh, an individual to feel the pressure to go somewhere, to be present somewhere and to show up and, and showcase your work um, because that's simply how it's, how, 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 it's, how it's going and what is expected of you. Um, so I think we should, have more conversations about what are viable solutions. Um, I think for, also for um, for young designers, for example, we had a discussion last week um, with a, a group of uh, um, creatives here in the Netherlands. How can we support young designers uh, who are graduating at this moment, who would normally have their graduation shows and exhibitions and the chances to partake in um, in competitions and so on. Um, how can we help them incre with increased visibility of their work um, now that they cannot showcase their work? So that, that question kind of relates to this. I don't have a clear cut answer to it. Um, also because a lot of artworks, I mean, I'm really happy to have this conversation online, for example, um, but in case of a physical artwork that requires someone to experience it and that needs to be shipped over to the other side of the world, for example, to do so. I mean, of course, there's, there's definitely ways to make it more sustainable and to have it shipped uh, differently and, and not with an airplane and, and so on. Um, but we need to have that be facilitated and be organized differently. Um, and I think that requires a collaborative effort for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to think about how we value physical connection. And, you know, like if we weren't experiencing um, the pandemic right now, uh, we wouldn't be having this particular conversation. Um, like, I don't think I would have thought like, oh, yeah, someone from the Netherlands should be in a conversation at IBM in New York, because like, Zoom, like, why would we do that, right? It just wouldn't, it would be, um, so it would be a very different event. Like, I don't, yeah. Um, and I think one thing before the pandemic that I saw happening in more like academic conference contexts was people trying to push for telepresence. Um, and so I think right now we're finding out, like, I'm hopeful that, you know, this conversation has been, um, has resonated with you all and it didn't seem like a, you know, the digital wall separating us was like a barrier to that. And I think that is maybe something to keep in mind after the pandemic, like, um, you know, we can have meaningful connections in a digital space, but, but at the same time, um, it is very important to keep in mind that at the end of the day, the people causing this problem are not, you know, maybe if you're like a really successful person who's flying every single day, I mean, even flying a lot's a problem, but um, you know, it's the oil companies, the gas companies, it's the airlines that refuse to um, make, their, make their planes more efficient. They're really the, 
you know, the people making money off the crisis and the infrastructure that perpetuates these, um, these problems. So the fact that you might need to use this problematic infrastructure to support your, you know, to have the life you want, um, it's, you know, I think you need to balance those concerns. Yeah. Thanks both. Um, this is coming from Naomi. There's a lot of wonderful questions, by the way, in the chat, in okay. the chat box. So awesome. this is, this is great. Um, this question is coming from Naomi Wright, uh, Art and Energy CIC. Uh, Art and Energy CIC based in uh, Devon, UK, uses new materials and upcycles throwaway materials to make artworks. Pauline, are there any of the textile solar materials available as offcuts or secondhand? Mm, nice question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think once we get uh, going with the soda weaving project, we'll definitely uh, have some, some offcuts and samples uh, left over. Um, for the rest of uh, the work that I've made, actually, in that sense, I maybe have worked very sustainably because I don't have any leftovers. Like all of the <laughs> material that I developed was actually turned into a garment. Um, I think, yeah, even the, even the leftover samples from the solar t-shirt, I actually turned them into um, little pouches that I gave to my um, uh, supervisors from my PhD committee last year. Um, so I don't have that much left over, but I'm happy to um, to uh, to look into it and also uh, maybe see with some of the suppliers that I work with if I can arrange anything or be yeah have you be involved in the in the solar weaving project that would be nice also. So yeah, do reach out. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Oh, here's here's yet another from uh, Naomi and CIC. Uh, We've enjoyed your reference to nature and our relationship with it enhanced through solar art and design. Is there more we can do with the connection between nature and climate change and solar art and design, i.e. education, tree planting, et cetera? Thoughts on that? Oh, wow, yeah, there's a lot. Do you want to start, <laughs> Alex, maybe? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways um, you can sort of make those connections deeper. I mean, from like an art angle, um, I know there's a lot of artists who have used solar cells as um, sort of uh, representing leaves on a tree and things like that in various art projects. Um, so I think there are like symbolic connections, you know, ranging from like very literal to very abstract um, that, that can be explored in terms of um, sort of physical like tree planting things. Um, there can also be, you know, one of the earliest like photovoltaic solar power artworks is a sound piece by Joe Jones, who's a Fluxus artist um, who lived in the US and then moved to the UK later in his life. And it's, you know, um, solar powered little noisemakers just sus suspended from a tree um, that sort of, you know, blow in the wind and things like that, almost like a chime. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of ways to connect to other, um, yeah, other, other natural things for sure. Uh, yeah, one, one other thing I was, I was thinking of, um, maybe not literally related to, to solar art, but, um, more in, in, in the fashion context and, and using um, natural materials for, for example, dyeing uh, textiles. I think in the, in the context of education or craft or, or art or design, um, just gathering your own um, uh, food leftovers, you know, like onion peel or um, avocado, the core of the avocado, the seed, um, uh, or using kind of like herbs or any kind of like plant that you can find in your immediate environment and trying to like make a dye bath with it and dye your own yarns or, or textiles. I think that also really, um, yeah, helps you look at, first of all, your environment in a different way. Um, 
and be creative with the things that are at hand. Um, even using the materials that in principle are already solar powered, I would say. Um, and then also using them to, to, to dye something that also gets a new kind of value when you have made it yourself. And um, um, also a lot of these dyes actually are, are also affected by sunlight differently from, from artificial dyes. So it does really change uh, how, you, how you look at these, uh, uh, these materials, I think, over time. Yeah, and actually just to add to that, there is, um, I know, I don't know if anyone's successfully done that, but some folks have talked to me about it um, at various points is just, um, are there ways to make your own dye sensitized photovoltaic cells? Mm -hmm. So um, that's a, for folks um, who, who aren't aware, there's tons of different types of photovoltaic cells beyond what we normally see. Um, one sort of group of them are, transparent uh, tinted um, essentially like glass looking materials um, that tend to be different colors and the different colors respond differently to wavelengths of light um, and I I think I don't have this understanding but I think someone with a chemistry background and a DIY approach could um, make their own and that would be with like natural dyes and that could potentially be very exciting I would love to see something like that. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I'm taking over from Jay and reading the next question. So we have um, a question from Ogis. If you both have done any teaching, how have you integrated your research into how you teach and what you teach? How do educational institutions or organizations improve how these types of concepts for larger issues of sustainability are worked into curricula across all disciplines. Um, yeah, I, so I've, I've done a ton of teaching um, with solar in particular, and part of, what, part of how it's integrated depends on the learning outcome you want. So if I'm teaching young kids, then it's um, very different than if I'm teaching uh, adult artists, which is different than if I'm teaching high school kids who want to become solar installers, and it's like a less of a creative thing. Um, but I have uh, actually, I, I'll post a link in the chat, but I have um, a lot of educational resources um, that I post on my Solar Power for Artists website as like an open source. Um, educational resource. And so that's sort of the basis of how I develop a lot of curriculums. Um, but I find like the simplest stuff goes really far. Um, connecting a solar cell directly to like a little, um, a little piezo noisemaker or a um, like tiny uh, low voltage uh, like vibration motor, um, those can have like really immediate satisfying impacts that the user almost right away understands how solar power functions. Yeah, I think you have a valuable, very valuable resource of information there, uh, Alex. It's really great for teaching purposes. I myself, I mean, I uh, I don't think I've done as much teaching as, as you've done, Alex. Um, I've done, I've given several um, uh, workshops in mostly in design schools context, whether it's interaction design um, or industrial design or, or fashion design. Um, and what I try to always do, I, the kind of like guideline or thought that I, philosophy that I try to bring in from my research into, the, into that teaching practice is um, the idea that material informs the body, informs material. And it's this kind of reciprocal relationship between materials and the moving, um, um, expressive human body. Um, so all of my lessons are um, centered around exploring materials on, on a body. Um, so it's really this embodied approach that I try to teach them because a lot of uh, design students are um 
well, they're often, especially nowadays, trained to do a lot of sketching and model and uh, work on their computer. Um, and even more so when they end up in the design industry where they actually draw up something, come up with an idea and sketch it and make all the specs and then it's sent off and being made somewhere, I don't know, across the ocean uh, in another country. Um, and I think this kind of like separation between designing and making is really problematic. So yeah, whenever I teach some th something, uh, I try to have people engage with the material hands-on and try to put things on their body and see how the material behaves. And especially also with technology because uh, design students, they can, um, when you give them a piece of technology, they immediately start looking at, okay, what can I do with it? How does it function? Um, what is it used for or what they really take the easily get trapped in this kind of like technological technocratic view and just by kind of like uh, loosening up that connection and just putting it on your body and trying to see how it moves or how it reflects light or how it, uh, it changes angle and suddenly creates an optical illusion or like whatever the materials especially also solar cells may do when you when you wear it and that is a different starting point. Um, so that's what I usually try to teach them. Um, and the second part, how do educational institutions improve? Well, I'm personally, I'm, I'm uh, involved in a um, um, uh, European uh, project that is focused on uh, fashion technology education. Uh, so I try to advise them how to bring um, this kind of like practical, pragmatic and embodied approach into their um, uh, curricula and to better prepare them also for working with the, within the industry. Um, so yeah, I do feel that at least um, for some of these uh, educational institutes here in, in Europe, um, they're, they're picking up on the fact that this should be part of their curricula. Uh, whereas when I was um, studying, um, I didn't learn anything about technology or electronics or that was not part of my world at that point. Yeah, I think um, to the point about educational institutions, in the US at least, um, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to decouple the um, you know, climate uh, denialism and narratives that are put forward by um, large fossil fuel companies. We need to sort of decouple that from uh, the education system because um, the average person, even the average teacher um, in certainly in like a public school in the US, they're not a climate expert. So thinking about how these ideas interact with, you know, history or um, other subjects, I think is, is important. And there's been a lot of really good research by, um, I'm forgetting uh, this person's last name, Emily, I believe it's Emily, um, but uh, the, she has a, a project called Heated, and she's a, a really good climate journalist, and she's recently done a lot of research on um, fossil fuel company propaganda in public schools in the U.S., um, where, like, the teaching material is from, you know, a fossil fuel lobby company. Um, so I think there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of work to do um, changing uh, the narrative around these things. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks both. Um, it looks like that may have been our, our, our last question in the chat box, but maybe I'll turn it over to the both of you for final, final thoughts. Um, Alex, I know you have a book coming out in uh, next year, A History of Solar Power Art and Design. Uh, it's going to come out by Rutledge, so be on the lookout for that. Um, yeah, maybe a couple final thoughts from you both. Um. I feel like we just talked about so many different things. <laughs> I don't know. Um, thank you for everyone for your great questions. Um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation um, and happy to receive also so many, so many good questions. Uh, I think that really added another layer to, uh, to this already exciting conversation. And um, thanks, IBM, also for hosting this. It's uh, wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for your collaboration and this wonderful conversation and 
to the audience, the amazing questions in the chat box. I think it's been really fruitful. And uh, yeah, we're just so grateful. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Everyone's saying thank you in the chat box. Fantastic. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.